My name is Dennis Speed, and on behalf of the LaRouche Political Action Committee, I want to welcome you to the final Saturday Dialogue with LaRouche for the year 2017. In one sense, we'll be doing a kind of summary of the year, but actually, we're at an inflection point, which is in one sense more important for us to describe and discuss. The election of President Donald Trump was one of the most important upsets uh, of the period after the Second World War, and certainly after 1971, the taking of the dollar off the gold standard. What it will actually ultimately mean is largely up to the people in this room and the people associated with this movement. There's a need to emphasize uh, an upshift, an intellectual upshift that's needed uh, in our work. Uh, Lyndon LaRouche has always been known for providing the catalyst for that kind of intellectual upshift. What we're going to do today is, in order to launch ourselves into that new year, is we're going to have two presentations. And for the first presentation, I want to introduce Diane Sayre from the Policy Committee of the LaRouche Political Action Committee, who will begin uh, not merely by doing a summary of the past year, but saying a few things about the question of the method that's required for us to think about how to approach victory in the coming year. So, Diane. Hi, could you put the first thing of my slides up there? Uh, that's okay, I can just sit there. Um, so the question that I think has to be raised for the American people is whether or not we are morally fit to survive. Uh, and I think this is a very important question for the United States, given what's going on in other parts of the world and other countries and the role that we potentially could be playing in this. And I don't think that we know what the answer to that question is here. That Now, as Dennis just said, and I've been thinking about this a lot recently, the year, sorry, hold on a second. Okay. Um, that once we have won this fight, which I am determined that we will, we'll look back on the year of 2016 and see that, as Dennis said, it was really a turning point. It was a revolution, and it was not something that Lynn and Helga did not predict. Uh, in 1989, when the Berlin Wall came down, and people may or may not know LaRouche's relationship to that, I'm not going to go into that in great detail today, I'll reference it later, but there was a bankruptcy of the communist system, of the Soviet system, and LaRouche had forecast this, and he had also in 1988 called for the reunification of Germany. Um, and when this occurred, the LaRouches said that this collapse of the Soviet system is not a victory for the free trade system of the West. That in fact, the free, the British empire, the British free trade system is also going to collapse. And this revolutionary ferment, and some of you here may remember it, some of you may not, but the kind of things that were happening in 1989, uh, following the events in Tiananmen Square, which was in June, and then by September, November, you had Lithuania, you had various uh, countries breaking free. And then in Germany, it was very dramatic because you had candlelight vigils going on against the regime. I think at that point, something like one in three people in East Germany was spying on their neighbors. Children were recruited in schools and not that different than what's going on today in the United States. And Eric Honecker, the dictator of East Germany, made a speech where he said socialism is going to live a thousand years. And just a few days later, uh, well, word came down, I think this is very important, that um, they were going to get to a breaking point, that there potentially was going to be a crackdown on these peaceful demonstrations. And when people got that word, rather than 
hiding in their homes, they came out in very large numbers. Now imagine what is the mentality of coming out in large numbers knowing that that moment potentially you could be mowed down by a tank. What's the spirit of this? Why was it that Pink Floyd was not the music of this era and Beethoven was, for example? Uh, and what happened was the wall came down and Eric Honecker, who had made his speech about the thousand year reign of this, was on his way out of the country on a plane. Um, so that revolution has now reached, reached the United States in 2016. Not surprisingly, it hit Britain a little bit earlier with the Brexit vote. You can think about that. Who would have thought that anyone would rebel against the um, beneficent dictatorship of the European Central Bank and the European Union? And then, uh, and you remember what was said about that, that this was just the right wing, racist, anti-immigrant, something or other reaction. And obviously there are certain ugly anti-human strains in some of these movements, but that was not the dominating factor. The issue was that the economy had collapsed, that people had been beaten down, but that fundamentally people want to live. If you're sitting there and you're watching your children be become stupider than you, have more difficulties in their life, have to move back home because they can't possibly make a living enough to pay off their tuition, uh, then this really kind of goes against the grain because what any human being would hope is that their children and their grandchildren would live better than they do. And uh, really, if we're not total egomaniacs, we would hope that our children and grandchildren would be better people than we are. Uh, so there's a natural principle, Schiller writes about it in the Rutley Oath, uh, that, that there is a limit to a tyrant's power. That's what happened. Now, it doesn't mean that the population that had been crushed under this economic dictatorship knew what to do. And I'll let you think about that. In the United States, we had the election of Donald Trump. And if people remember, and I didn't have time to run back and pull out my ad that was in the New York Times from Netflix. You might remember they had a four page spread on this new film about the Queen of England. And it said, she is blah, blah. And it was clearly, and it was released on election day. It was timed for the election of Hillary Clinton, which everyone assumed would happen. And now we know that they had good reason to assume it would happen because all 17 intelligence agencies were backing Hillary Clinton's campaign. The FBI, the CIA, the NSA, the DNC, and Satan himself, otherwise known as... <laughs> Barack Obama, uh, were prepared to steal the election for Hillary Clinton. Uh, she, as we now know, was given control and effect of the purse strings of the DNC in the year 2015. Now, when was the first Democratic primary? Uh, well, of the 2016 election, I don't believe they have primaries in the year before the election. So the first primary was well after Hillary Clinton was given a financial dictatorship over the Democratic National Committee. But I know it was the Russians who were meddling with our election. And we have very free and fair elections in the United States, obviously. And how dare anyone say that we don't? Um, <clears throat> so... Clearly, the defeat of Hillary with all of this backing was an extraordinary shock. Now, Trump, therefore, won the election. And as many of you have observed, Trump has not always come across as the most well-heeled politician we ever saw. Uh, he probably would have flunked out of finishing school if they had such a thing for men. Um, but President Trump, unlike either Bush or Obama, uh, actually loves the United States, that people have a sense that Trump has, feels an affinity for the American people, and that he won the election, one, because he 
has this affinity for people. He addressed the forgotten men and women of the country, but also some very important points. Um, he knew that if you're going to promote the general welfare of the people of the United States, having a nuclear war with Russia would not be a good approach to that. Um, he also knew that these regime change wars, as he keeps talking about, he's $7 trillion spent in Iraq or in the Middle East, which he would say could have been spent here. The idea of make America great again, in terms, what does that mean? To raise the standard of living of the American people. So because of the potential and it is right now a potential, and that's why so much depends on the people in this room and the people who watch this. Because of this potential of the Trump presidency of the United States in this revolutionary moment, the old British empire, which operates through our intelligence agencies and through Wall Street, but it is British. Think about Christopher Steele and where he originates from and what he is. Um, is determined to bring down the Trump presidency and to destroy the United States and to destroy the legacy of the United States. Now, thankfully, because President Trump actually likes to fight, uh, he has not shriveled up and given up as many people were afraid he would. And the fact that he's done that has made it possible for the LaRouche Political Action Committee to be able to get traction in tearing apart this treasonous network. And as people here know, in, I think it was October, we put, published the first 10,000 copies of the dossier on Robert Mueller. Two days after that went out to the House Intelligence and Judiciary Committees, 19 congressmen were calling for investigations and hearings on him. And as you know, there's been very significant breakthroughs and developments, which is how we realize now that it was such a miracle that Hillary lost the election because they were all working for her um, at that time. Now, so what determines whether we survive, whether mankind survives or not? And why am I saying that this is a question for the people of the United States? And what I wanted to take up is the question of natural law. Uh, whatever religious persuasion people here may be, um, it should be obvious to you as it becomes more and more obvious to the greatest scientists that there are principles which govern our universe, that there are principles which govern it in the very large and also in the very small, and that much of this dynamic is not always obvious to our limited senses, but it exists. We do not live in a realm of chaos. There is order. And this is very interesting because within this order, there's also a principle which um, would seem in a certain way contradictory. Uh, Leibniz pointed out, for example, that if you think of the leaves on a tree, people who've collected leaves uh, in the autumn, can you find two leaves that are identical? Even if you're taking leaves from the same red maple tree and they all have five points and they all have characteristics which distinguish them from other leaves, but even if you collected every single leaf from every single red maple tree in the United States and you did it for 20 years, you would not discover two leaves that are identical. That's very interesting. Uh, and the, the other question on this is in time, but let's take what human beings do because it's also interesting because, and this is also somewhat of a paradox because you think about what we produce, we mass produce things. We do attempt to produce things that are identical. But even in that case, if you take two pennies which have been produced by human beings, and you examine these pennies under a microscope, you will discover that the closer up you get and the larger you magnify it, the more different these two things are. Uh, 
so this is indeed very paradoxical because universe, una means one. There is a principle, but somehow within this universe, there are no two anythings that are identical. Uh, so while in our mind, we might be able to conceive of two things that are identical, or we might be able to conceive of a perfect circle or a perfect sphere or a perfect square. When we get to attempting to do this in the real world, there actually is not such a thing, but it is a principle. Now, similarly, in the question of time, if you take your leaf uh, or even your penny, is it the same from one minute to the next minute? Don't things happen to these things even if they're not living? So we can also think about human beings where perhaps it's more obvious because we can change willfully. But you hear people say, probably one of the most stupid things we can ever say is same old, same old. <laughs> There's no such thing. Doesn't occur. Everything is changing all the time. There is nothing in the universe which is constant except this principle of change. And even our bodies and our personalities, and I think in our, our bodies, this may be wrong, but somewhere I heard that all of our cells have changed within about seven years or so. So even what we think we are is not physically the same. So now that we've contemplated this question of whether things can be the same, whether they can be identical, think about some of the language that you hear, like sustainable development. Impossible. There is no such thing in this universe. How about zero growth? It doesn't exist. That because everything is always changing, there is a directionality to it of necessity. There is no such thing as sustainability. There is no such thing as being on a plateau of the same level forever. It doesn't exist. So in the case of human economy, there are two choices. We are either progressing or we are collapsing, period. There is nothing in between. Now, Lyndon LaRouche's scientific breakthrough, one of his scientific breakthroughs, was the question of how do you measure this? And what he uh, discovered or invented was a principle of measurement called relative potential population density, which sounds like a big mouthful, but you can take it apart relative potential population population density. We know what that is. In the state of New Jersey right now, you have 1,200 people per square mile. Now, I don't know if that's actually what our potential population density is or not. I suspect, given the destruction of the economy and the amount of homelessness and so on, our population relative potential population density might be less than 1,200 people per square mile. And it could become much less since they're talking about shutting down two of the four nuclear power plants in the state. New Jersey relies about 50% on nuclear power for its energy. So what happens if you cut the energy in New Jersey by 50%? Well, how about people in hospitals? who depend on electricity or having temperatures kept a certain level or people in apartment buildings or people who are frail who cannot have their thermostat at 45 degrees in the winter and 95 degrees in the summer. And what will happen is indeed you do not have a stop at 1,200 people per square mile, but what you would see in that case is a collapse where the death rate would increase and people would die at increasing rates. And ultimately, you would probably get an implosion of nothing. Now, of course, this is a little bit of a contrived example because New Jersey is not a closed system. We depend on energy and food. There's you know, all kinds of trade and so on. But you can begin to think of why Mr. LaRouche would take this measure, 
relative potential population density as the measurement for how you determine whether your economy is going in the right direction or in the wrong direction. So the question that we want to look at is how, how do you create a system, an economic policy, which allows you to increase the relative potential population density? And if you think through that more, you'll think that there are obviously certain things which are absolutely criti critical, like energy, right? Burning wood, if we had to go back to burning wood because they shut down the nuclear plants, I don't know, could we have three people per square mile? Maybe, I don't know. Um, less. In other words, there are certain things. If you get to nuclear fusion, which China is working on, China's talking about having a, a fusion burn that lasts months, uh, sometime after 2023 or so. The ITER reactor in France, which we are insanely not contributing our fair share to, I think we sent them $50 million, which is ridiculous. They're talking about getting um, a fusion burn for 10 minutes. If you have energy that you need very, very small amounts of fuel for very large amounts of energy, obviously what this gives you is the potential to sustain more people at a higher standard of living. What our parents, what any parent would want, any sane person would want, that you would want the future generation to be larger, to live longer, to be better educated, to be free of disease, to have freedom to develop their mind, to be full of Beethoven's and Einstein's. That's what you would think. So let's take a look at, um, oh, can I do this? Let's see. So this function, can we, yeah, um, is called LaRouche's, well, it's, the, it's famously known as the triple curve. And it's very important that when you look at this, this is not three separate lines. This is one function that is, if you know how functions work on a graph, when you move a certain direction on what seems to be one line, you are necessarily moving a direction on the other line. They're not separate. So this is of a piece. Now he put this out in 1996. Uh, we had not yet reached that point where the gray line of financial aggregates crossed over the monetary aggregates. That really happened with full force in 2008, where we did the bailouts, right? Then the quantitative easing and the printing of trillions of dollars. But this is a, a shock function because what you see is these lines are approaching an asymptote, uh, the uh, vertical line. And physical economic output, in other words, the more you print money, the more you pump money into a bubble, the more you loot your actual physical economy, the part of the economy that you depend on to make the breakthrough in relative potential population density. Now, I will show you a couple things that should allow you to reflect on this and how insanely dangerous it is for anyone to say that we are in a recovery because the stock market is going up. The stock market going up means that we are in a total collapse and this thing is going to crash and that is not an indication of a recovery. Next. Oh, I'll do it. Okay. So this is my first very wonderful slide. Now, um, that's going up, right? Didn't we have a fantastic economic recovery under Obama? I mean, that is the reason that Hillary Clinton won the election, right? It was the great recovery under Obama. Now, what, and you see it goes till 2016, 2008. What were we doing? We were printing money and it built up this wonderful bubble. Now, what else did printing all that money do? it increased the cost of living massively for everybody in the United States and in Western Europe. So what do you have now in the United States? You have an increase in the death rate for the first time really since the Great Depression. You have record deaths of heroin overdoses. You have massive unemployment and you have infrastructure which is disintegrating. But you can see it was brilliant. Next slide. Can this work? Do we dare? 
Oh, Dow up about 4,500 points since the election. Isn't that wonderful? President Trump and President Obama have created a phenomenal recovery and it's going up at the same rate. Think about the triple curve. This indicates that we are headed for a major blowout, far worse than what happened in 2008 and 2009. Now, next slide. Oh, I can use my clicker hook setting. Does anyone recognize this? Nope, close, could be. Yes, it's the George Washington Bridge. Now, I know that these structures are, you know, strong enough and that you could say the rust is just on the surface, but why do, why is the bridge being allowed to rust out like this? And why does it cost $15 to cross a bridge that is rusting out like this? Yeah, right. Here's another picture. Um, you can see those little wooden boards there. That part of the road is actually a sidewalk. Uh, a month later, and this is a bridge which goes over a railroad track. This is in New Jersey um, off the turnpike. You can take this to get into Union, New Jersey or head toward the Lincoln Tunnel. Um, a couple months after I took this picture, the sidewalk was blocked up with traffic cones because if you walk down the sidewalk, you would just fall straight down a hole uh, to the railroad below. But that's that's our info. This is the recovery that that stock market bubble um, is indicating. Um, now let's see. Next. All right. You can read this, I presume. This is from. Um, a website on homelessness. In October 2017, there were 62,963 homeless people, including 15,689 homeless families with 23,707 homeless children sleeping each night in the New York City municipal shelter system. Families comprise just over three quarters of the homeless shelter population. That is only the homeless people who are in the shelter system. That is not the homeless people who are either on the streets, in the subway, or the homeless people who are living in other people's homes. Because particularly since Sandy, since there really was no reconstruction, you have had many families that have moved in together. And they are saying that actually in New York City, I believe it's something like 100,000 children who are homeless. And we've reached a rate in the elementary school system where one out of seven children is homeless. Now, what is the impact of that on the ability of the rest of the class to learn anything or the teacher to teach anything if one in seven children does not know where they're sleeping, comes in hungry, has a parent who has mental health issues, is addicted to drugs, is living on the street, et cetera. Um, next. Sorry, I've got to get used to this. Um, so the question is, how do you address this? How do we move to increase the relative potential population density? And here is a video, which I'm not going to show you, but, and it's maybe a little hard to see these pictures. There's a company, which I think is actually co, it looks like Dutch and Haitian or something, which is being funded by the Chinese, which has a plan for, there's an overall investment of maybe 40 billion, but I think for the city of Haiti, it's much, I mean, of Port-au-Prince, it's much smaller. What the video goes through is to take Port-au-Prince, which people remember the earthquake, the hurricanes, the devastation of this place, and rebuild the thing. They're saying they could build water management systems there within three years. And they're talking about a sewage system that would handle um, rainwater that you would not get more of in a three-year period, flood water systems for 50-year and 100-year floods, a water treatment plant which would handle 225,000 cubic meters of water per day, et cetera. And that's the way they're talking about rebuilding this very impoverished city. Uh, let's look at the United States. Here's Houston after Harvey. 
There are parts of Texas right now that are nowhere near being rebuilt where people are leasing out space on their property for people to come in and live in tents. This is Houston, Texas. It's part of the United States. California, wildfires. We can't, we have to have sustainable development. So how dare we even think of moving water anywhere other than where mother nature intended water to be. So we cannot possibly do anything to um, ameliorate the effect of dry weather or anything about it. And when you get fires like this, since we haven't done any water management, it can be very hard to uh, put them out. This is Puerto Rico, which is the responsibility of the United States. Uh, they still don't have electricity. And I just saw in the papers this morning, there are 72 families. There are hundreds of families from Puerto Rico who've been taken in all over the United States. Um, in New Jersey, there's 72 families who are being housed in the United States, or in, in New Jersey right now. And the funding for that housing is about to end. So what are they going to do? Go back to this? I don't know. Um, so think about Franklin Roosevelt and his approach to the Tennessee Valley, which was a malaria-infested, backward place of people who couldn't read. And they had to send demonstration agents down there to talk to people to explain to them why it might be beneficial to have electricity and they sent trailers with libraries in them to educate people and teach them to read. But FDR was convinced, along with others, that if you could harness the power of the Tennessee River through water management, one, you would end all this, this cycle of flooding, all the topsoil getting washed away, you'd get rid of the mosquitoes, you'd get free people from malaria. And so this horribly impoverished backward area became a driver of the economic recovery of the United States. Think about President Kennedy and what he said about why we go to the moon and do the other things, as he said. He said, we do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Uh, and it's not only that we like the challenge, um, but the interesting thing Thing is it's natural it's part of the universe that human beings get very happy we get very excited when we make a discovery about something that we didn't know how to do before or a discovery and this again is the principle of change um, the again you progress or you collapse uh, and we will only survive if we can continue to make these discoveries. And the most amazing thing, the extraordinary thing about the size of the universe, and President Trump did a wonderful video when he first came in about the scientist, I forget the name of the person who worked on the Hubble uh, telescope, people may remember, because he wanted to focus on this very, very dark area where they thought there were no more stars. And once the, the light had enough time to to come in what they discovered were billions and billions of stars and millions of galaxies it's enormous so the good news is about making these discoveries contrary to obama's view of the universe that we we are not in danger of perfection we're not in danger of making all the discoveries that there are to be made and um, solving everything now, LaRouche is an expert at this. LaRouche um, was the leader of something he organized years ago called the Fusion Energy Foundation. And as part of this, if you can see those signs, they say, beam the bomb. In the 1970s, Lyndon LaRouche began a fight to get a laser defense system against nuclear missiles. And you may say, well, wasn't this crazy? Jimmy Carter was president at the time. Who would ever think you could do such a thing? Um, LaRouche found a friend in Ronald Reagan. Reagan was acutely aware, like very few presidents have been, 
of the danger of a nuclear war between the United States and the then Soviet Union. And President Reagan decided to go with LaRouche's policy and to make Mr. LaRouche the back channel of Reagan's negotiations with the Soviet Union. And it was after that, uh, and the pamphlet goes through it more, that Lyndon LaRouche was targeted by Robert Mueller and the entire apparatus that is trying to destroy President Trump, in a sense, for the same thing. Now, we did not have lasers in the 70s or 80s, or perhaps even now, that would be capable of preventing every nuclear missile from hitting its target. However, LaRouche knew just as Kennedy's intent to land a man on the moon and bring him safely home, that if you took this as an objective, that you would force the economy of the United States into a much higher level. You would force the discovery of new technologies. Had we done this when Lyndon LaRouche proposed it, we might already have discovered a cure for cancer. We might have solved many diseases. There are many factors in lasers that involve questions of tuning and resonance and all kinds of things that really have yet to be explored. Unfortunately, um, this policy, although it did lead to the Berlin Wall coming down, was largely abandoned and not funded. Now, the country that is making these breakthroughs today, um, China. This is the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, which I think is either finished or I think it may have just been finished or just about finished. I think they were building it for about eight years. It's extraordinary. In the course of building this bridge, they, they got 120 patents. That is, they had to make breakthroughs. They had to develop technologies to solve problems that they were encountering as they built this thing. And there are all kinds of very interesting problems. You, you can see in uh, some of the films concerns about um, dolphins and are they, and are, is your, are your fish, why, you know, marine life, et cetera, are they going to be affected? They were trying to figure out how to um, drill in pillars and things without creating total disruption, disruption of all the wildlife. I mean, just anyway, a totally delightful process. While you, you do things in a sane and respectful way, but nonetheless, you say, we are going to conquer this uh, terrain. We are going to solve this problem. This is President Trump not so long ago signing the first space policy directive. Um, Harrison Schmidt, Jack Schmidt is there in the picture with him, I think, on the end, right? Is that him? And the, oh, the gray hair. Okay. That one? I thought it was bad. Okay. Yeah. And in that little dome shaped thing they have is a piece of the moon, um, which is uh, very exciting. Making the point, of course, if we are going to get into outer space, as we should be doing and need to do, uh, we are going to have to establish a base of operations on the moon as Kraft Erica had pointed out. It makes a lot of sense if you're going to try and get the thrust to get really far out in the solar system or other places to have a base of operations which is not encumbered by the Earth's gravity and magnetic field and so on. Tom will tell you more about that and other um, potentials. But again, I think this that this occurred indicates the potential in the direction of what LaRouche is saying um, of this the Trump administration. Now, these breakthroughs that we're talking about, the 120 patents that happened on this Macau, Zhuhai, Hong Kong bridge, where do they occur? The breakthroughs occur in the mind of human beings. That is the source of wealth of civilization is not Bitcoin, or money, it is in the mind and the development of human beings. And you can ask yourself, how likely is it that a child who is in a refugee camp, or in this case, a child who is in the New York City school system and homeless, is going to be able to make such a scientific discovery? Uh, and that is why 
in China, they have resolved that there will be no more people living below the poverty line by the year 2020. And the way China is solving this is, is solving this is not running around giving people checks or money. They are insisting that the leaders of each region get to actually personally know the families that are below the poverty line and figure out, and they said the biggest challenge is to inspire ambition that people who've been impoverished for a long time have the idea that their lives can become better, that they can be productive. But that is the approach. It's very personal. And at the 19th Communist Party Congress, China said the entire world should have no one in poverty by 2050. The entire world. Now, Putin just announced that Russia is going to take a similar measure. The 20 million people below the poverty line in Russia, he wants to address and do something about that. India has just announced that by 2019, every single home is going to have electricity. Um, so this is the direction. If you really want to increase the prosperity, then you have to increase the well-being of the population because you don't know which member of the population is going to make the scientific breakthrough or the creative artistic breakthrough upon which the future of mankind depends. And I was thinking about that in the context of what people probably heard, um, this horrific fire that happened in the Bronx uh, where 12 people died, I, a three-year-old, child who liked lighting the burners and the mother said this had been a problem and the kid lit a burner and there were a bunch of flames and she grabbed the kid and grabbed another kid and ran out and left the door open and the building is a hundred years old and so the flames just went straight up through the building people were trapped inside and 12 people died that was last night here what's the relationship between that and poverty. What are the conditions of living in the Bronx? When was the last time this building was modernized? How many people were living in each apartment? So the question is, can we do something to ensure that those people didn't die in vain? Will this three-year-old grow up with the opportunity to make a scientific discovery uh, that can transform the human race and can make mankind immortal. And that is the question for everybody here. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you, Diane. Uh, this year is the... Uh, centenary of the uh, birth of JFK. He was born May 29th, 1917. And um, it's also the coming year, 2018, will be the 50th anniversary of the assassination of his uh, two brothers, Robert Kennedy uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, one was his brother in the flesh, the other was his brother in spirit. Um, these were not people that agreed with one another often, but they did all merit assassination. And the reason for that was that they had a power to move people or to think in terms of what could be done to change society. And, and that is a very important element of what it is we're looking that we, that Lyndon LaRouche in particular has been able to do. Uh, Tom Weissmuller, who we're going to hear from, has been working in the NASA uh, program in various ways for a long time. He worked throughout, uh, throughout NASA during the Apollo moon landings, still lectures at NASA field centers. Uh, he last October keynoted uh, uh, Rome's climate conference, and in 2016, he chaired the oceanographic section at the World Congress of Oceans in Qingdao, China, the conference that happened there. He was the featured uh, presenter on uh, the, well, he talks about various things on climate change and so on, but it's more than that. He's involved in a kind of scientific dialogue that with the people all over the world now. He's also uh, been uh, most notable for us for his ability to jump in a car and travel very long distances at the drop of a hat 
for the purpose of engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat with foolishness. Uh, and that's very much appreciated. And we have plenty of that going around. And uh, therefore, it, he's always welcome here. So we're going to hear from Tom. And uh, then hopefully we're going to go into some questions and answers and so on uh, on both, uh, both topics. It's Tom. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, I just want to let you know that although you see the, the, what we call the NASA meatball up here, I'm not representing NASA. I'm just speaking for myself, uh, perhaps maybe for the NASA TRCS group. But this is my presentation, my own opinion. Do not take it as official from the agency. And you'll see at the top here, you'll see a few other strange looking uh, variants. I'm going to talk about that. They were designed by Buzz Aldrin. But we're going to talk about where NASA is going. And we're, then we're going to talk about why we need to uh, go in that direction. Let's see if I can. Here we go. Uh, this is the moon. Lunar near side, lunar far side, which you really can't see from Earth. That's going to be the next objective. Uh, Donald Trump announced it when he signed the, uh, the, the space document that, that Diane just referred to. Uh, there are important reasons to go back to the moon. And near the moon's poles, up here and down here, uh, we hope to find helium-3, uh, a compound that is vital for the development of fusion energy. Uh, so we want to establish a, a base on the moon kind of looking like this. This is an artist's representation. Uh, so we're going to come back to the moon. Personally, I hope we do it with the help and participation of other nations. Uh, the Soviets, the Chinese, Europeans. Uh, this is a wor worthy world objective, although I really believe NASA has the capability of managing this very well. And we've shown that we can do it. Uh, this is Buzz Aldrin. Buzz Aldrin, the second guy to walk on the moon, he has his T-shirt on. And now I'm going to talk about what's in the T-shirt. Uh, <clears throat> he's standing in front of Stonehenge, by the way, and he's talking to humanity. And he's basically saying, in a test pilot's lingo, get your ass to Mars. All right? However, we're not going to... And, and if you notice, the, uh, the regular NASA logo has a flourish going in a little different direction here. All right, uh, Buzz and a number of other people, and I'm included in there, want to turn around the direction of the agency. We want to have, go somewhere else. You'll see two white dots here. Here's a big one, and here's a small one. And the big one is Phobos. That's the inner moon of Mars. Deimos is the smaller outer moon. The inner moon is important. Why? Because it rotates around the planet three times in one day, very fast. All right. If we decide to go to Phobos, then we don't have to put as much fuel into braking energy as we would if we were trying to land on the planet. We're going to catch up to that fast-moving moon, stay there for uh, a year and a half, and then when we come back to Earth, we go from the other side. We get a boost from Phobos to come back. Uh, very energy-saving. I'm going to get into more detail in Phobos in a, in a second. Uh, this is what Mars looks like. Uh, we've even named most of the craters and deserts and things that are on Mars. Uh, this is a fanciful, this comes from the movie The Martian, all right? Uh, the key here, by the way, is a rotating spacecraft. By the way, see all that glass on here? Forget it. We don't need glass in spacecraft. You need a small, tiny uh, hole with a lens, and then we inside this capsule, you can have a nice, broad, flat screen to look out. Uh, structurally, the integrity of the spacecraft is, is much more uh, uh, capable that way. We would need something like this because we would like to provide the astronauts with a 1G transit environment, meaning uh, until we get a mythical 1G engine, which probably would require fusion, meaning that we could have 1G halfway to Mars, turn it around and have 1G as we break, uh, 
uh, this rotating concept works. We would have to alter the Orion capsule that's already been designed to, to make this thing work. Lots of things have to be solved. I'll talk about a work breakdown structure later on because that's how the agency does this kind of thing. Uh, here's a target, Phobos. Fascinating inner moon of Mars, fast moving. Uh, you notice, I mean, there are some really things that we want to find out. Look at these staccato chains of, uh, like, like a machine gun hitter with, with, uh, with meteors. Uh, is this ice? Is this frozen carbon dioxide? We don't know, but we're going to find out. Uh, we've already mapped out places on Phobos where we want to hang around. Uh, a NASA paper did this. Lots of interesting things to do. And we're very close to the planet. This is what it might look like. Uh, there's some errors in this too, by the way. These are all artist representations. For instance, you notice the shadows of the solar collectors. Well, why would these solar collectors be uh, oriented without flipping them around to catch the sun? I mean, uh, we, we can improve on this a little bit. Uh, but this is what you're going to be looking at. On Phobos, looking at Mars, uh, a first step. We can't get to Mars right away. If you ever go down to Cape Kennedy and watch a launch and you see the gantry cranes and the fuel depots and the hundreds of people, none of that exists on Mars. We can't create that fast enough, but we can get off of Phobos because Phobos has extraordinarily low gravity. So for a first step, let's get over here. The view is beautiful, right? Uh, why should we put money into NASA? We've been putting money into very many strange things. We've been putting it in the $300 a gallon biofuel for the Navy and buying millions of gallons. We've been paying one and a half billion dollars to sequester CO2 underground in, in Illinois and then keeping it frozen. This is money being thrown down a rat hole. If we put it into NASA, these are the kind of things that we got out of the moon landings. Uh, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly because you can always stop the screen and, and get back to these uh, technological advancements in, in, in garments and clothing. How about medicine? If you go into a hospital today, almost all the instrumentation that was there is a byproduct in one way or another of the moon landings and the Apollo program. Look, look at all the things on, on this list. How about... <clears throat> Here's where NASA really excel, the work breakdown structure management. A work breakdown structure is basically all the tasks that you need to achieve a goal, and you map them out. You can cover a wall with all we needed to do to get to the moon. Some of the boxes will be red. Some of them will be green. The green ones are the ones we know that we can do that have already been done. The red ones, we still have to work on. Orange will be a different color. We're halfway there, that kind of thing. But what NASA did, first of all, it decided to have open patents. Open patents are very important. Anything technology that NASA was involved in, anybody can look at and anybody can make use of. Uh, the kinds of contracts we use, a CPFF, CPIS, a CPFF is cost plus fixed fee. We would pay a contractor a certain, uh, we cover all their costs and then we give them a fee to develop technology. If the technology didn't exist and we didn't know whether it could exist, we gave them CPIF, cost plus incentive fee. When they get it, they get paid more because they made this, this breakthrough. Uh, we had progress reporting, uh, different ways of government contracting. KT has kept Natrago and other uh, deviation analyses. Personally, I use them myself. Hal Dwarren from TRCS and I used them a couple of years ago when we addressed a, an audience at NASA Johnson Space Center showing why CO2 was not a major driver of climate. Uh, these are all ways to solve problems. Uh, chemistry, look at all, all the advances in chemistry, including battery development, fuel cells. None of this would have happened without the space program. Uh, <clears throat> physics, basic, basic research in physics, in energy, uh, and how to power uh, a spacecraft, solar cell uh, development. Uh, lots of, in, in my own field, meteorology and oceanographic uh, improvements all of which were a result of the space program. Electronics, we were trying to save weight on spacecraft. So what we did is we made things smaller. We got rid of vacuum tubes. We, we made transistors. Then we give them to ICs. Uh, if you would give a, a small integrated circuit and be able to go in a time machine and let George Washington take a look at it and say, what do you think this is, George? 
There's no way they would understand. We have gone so far and humanity has advanced so, so much because of things like the space program, imaging systems, photovoltaics uh, cells. And we have done all kinds of advancements, all of which arose out of the space program. Every job on the planet has been affected by the space program. Once I told this audience before someone had asked me, well, how about the guy digging ditches? And my answer to that is look at the titanium coating on his spade and tell me the space program hasn't been involved in making his job easier and, and, and better. Uh, so here's uh, Buzz Aldrin, he wants to go to Mars. He's right. Uh, and it's not Mars in, per se. Uh, this is a future development. This is Mackenzie and Petrov did this study. Uh, how to uh, dig into a hill. Uh, there were some problems with this study too, but we will eventually get people on Mars, settle them. Uh, the blueprints are there. Uh, the, these studies are available. Uh, we, have a, we have a neat objective. What we will learn in doing this is, is, is what's important. So <clears throat> I tell people, it's not the voyage to Mars or Phobos that matters. It's what we're going to be doing in order to get there. Uh, where we fill those red uh, blocks on the work breakdown structure to make the whole thing work. Uh, and then we spread that knowledge all over the world. And like I say, we share this voyage. Uh, the Orion spacecraft uh, module has room for three astronauts. Personally, <clears throat> I'd like to see an American, a Chinese person, and a Russian, or maybe a European occupying that. And I'd like to see those nations help pay for part of the, uh, this shouldn't be just an American thing. Although, believe me, I really believe that America can manage this. And President Trump has got the right people involved. You saw Jack Schmidt standing right next to him. Uh, Jack is the, uh, now the last living person to walk on the moon. Uh, is giving the president guidance, and the president is taking the guidance wisely. Uh, this is how humanity will flourish, by putting our dollars into this kind of technology creation, technology management, which will lift us out of poverty, not spending and wasting money to combat things like CO2 management, uh, which is where the, the government has been spending billions of dollars that would need we could use for this. And I, I end up by saying spacefaring is a wonderful alternative to war. So that's the, the end of my official slide set. And of course, I'm willing to take questions. Great. Yeah. All right, so listen, here, the, the microphone is open. So people can come up here now and begin to uh, ask questions. Uh, we'll just say that one of the it, and you please begin. Uh, but we just say that one of the reasons we wanted to take this approach is that the ability of people to dream and to dream of a future that they uh, deserve uh, is the, the, the key hallmark of a, of a society that has the moral fitness to survive. Uh, no one actually lives in the past, and you really don't live in the present either. Uh, the, the idea of a dream that powers a society uh, was the key to the Kennedy presidency. It was the one thing that Kennedy clearly did accomplish. Many things could not be done because of his assassination. But that dream, that vision, uh, which is what I meant by talking about Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King with respect to JFK, it was the that that was attacked with the assassinations that occurred. Obviously, the president has been under a certain attack, which is intended uh, uh, to character assassinate the presidency of the United States if not physically assassinate the presidency of the United States. And as we speak, uh, the uh, possibilities or potentials for the creation of war are something that he is trying to avoid in conjunction with his friends, uh, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, despite the fact that there's several people in and around the American intelligence and security establishments that are trying to promote precisely that as we speak. Um, that's the reason that we have to be very clear about the role of our organization and uh, Lyndon LaRouche and Helga LaRouche in particular with respect to the defense of the presidency, which is something that we stood for for a long time. Uh, and in what Lynn did back in 19, 
well, to, specifically with Ronald Reagan during the period of 1980 to 83, uh, that process uh, was, was, was best expressed. It's not merely a, a matter of getting rid of enemies. It's a matter of having a vision of the future, offering that, fighting for it, and being victorious, victorious in the success of that mission. Um, in part, that's happened with respect to our work with China uh, and Russia. Uh, and you see that in the form of the Silk Road and the policy that, that has been implemented there. But we have yet to get the United States into that policy. To do that, we're going to have to reverse that 54-year history um, that began, uh, uh, well, most was punctuated to have begun with that assassination November 22nd, 1963. So, okay, so if we have any questions, can you just come up? For you should be for either one of the speakers. Well, just wait. Fine, people, maybe people think I'm thinking. I'm cool. It's no problem. Question. Uh, is this on? Okay. Um, you guys spoke a lot Did about. Did you say you just give us your first name? We just know. Oh, my name is uh, Nicholas. Hello. Um, so you guys spoke a lot about this almost universal brotherhood of uh, mankind that we're all trying to gear together, at least those individuals in this room. Um, my question is, how do you explain that there are certain groups, you know, I'll say, for instance, Jewish people, they are completely overrepresented in every sector. In the United States and it seems to me that the United States is pursuing a policy that's more in line with what Israel wants than with what we want and what I would like to know is why is that not mentioned why is it also not mentioned that our president was associating with a very prominent and convicted pedophile Jeffrey Epstein these are personal questions I have not so much geared towards you know what you guys were talking about but I just want to know this because I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with the fact that my leaders may be engaging in this kind of, well, I don't know what you would call it. So that's my question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Diane's going to take this up in a minute. Let me just say one thing to everybody, uh, uh, which we need to, uh, and this, this has come up on the last two of our conference calls. And it's been very interesting, which is that we introduce a, 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 a level of discussion and then what happens is people tend to either panic or they sort of the mind goes blank because it doesn't actually seem to be what most people are thinking about but what we're doing is that we're winning a battle I and mean, that's been very specific in what has happened specifically around the case of Robert Mueller it's also however true with respect to the Chinese government and that was something that took a long period of time and I'm saying that because the, the, the nature of the problem of engaging in a discussion uh, of the type that we're doing, uh, not just here, but in general, is that we are provoking you to think in order to survive. Um, with respect to what you just asked about, I only wanted to say one thing, which is uh, we have judiciously and industriously, industriously avoided making a mistake that many people have made in trying to designate any group as being either the source of evil or conflict or the core problem. Uh, we do this, and, and, and with respect to the Jews in particular, let me say one thing here. You know, in, in, in the case of European civilization, in particular the case of classical music, it was Hitler's and Wagner's campaign earlier against the cosmopolitan Jew that was notable. And I say this because the tradition of Bach and uh, his uh, contributions to, to human civilization, which Mendelssohn, uh, Felix Mendelssohn in particular, uh, and uh, earlier other uh, persons uh, who worked together with uh, uh, who, others involved in that history, was, was crucial to preserving a tradition in Germany that Wagner and others attacked, and they used the fact that the people who were defending that tradition were Jewish to distort 
their actual attack. Their attack was on civilization. But they used that issue to bring something up which was completely beside the point. So I'm saying this because it's important to be clear if we look at, for example, the president's clear intent around China and Russia, the problem of Southwest Asia, mistakenly called the Middle East, will be directly addressed. I mean, if you had the president of the United States free to work with the Russians on Syria and actually eliminate ISIS, what you would find is that the overall policy for that entire area would begin to be solved because the Russians are very clear about it. The Chinese, by the way, are also going to get involved in the reconstruction of Syria. And uh, actually next week, we'll be doing an event which speaks directly to this on Saturday. And people are, of course, invited. We're doing a particular commemoration of the Alexandrov Ensemble. And, and uh, this is a group of, of musicians who were killed on their way to Syria to perform for the army that was fighting against terrorism. Um, what was said by Tom when, as he, in his course of his presentation about the idea of the Orion spacecraft, including a Chinese astronaut and a Russian astronaut with an American, gets at that, gets at that issue. Maybe the American will be a Jewish. Actually, maybe the Russian will be a Jewish. So maybe there'll be two Jews and somebody who's Chinese who, well, you know, Jews like Chinese food, so <laughs> may, maybe he'll be honorary. I mean, so I don't know. Is that, is that, a, is that, a, is that a bad thing? I, I don't think so. And so I, I just would stop there. And Diane has something more, shall we say, on the higher point. I actually wanted to raise as a question, what is a Jewish person? What is, okay, what is a Christian person? All right, how about a black person? Or a white person? How about a male person or a female person? How about a transgender person? who are vastly overrepresented who would say that. Because the I think there is human people. We have human people. And let me finish. Let me finish. Because the issue is what we're really fighting is something called geopolitics. You've heard that term? Okay. And that idea is to get all of us to conceive of these lower level divisions, including people who take these labels for themselves, right? I am royalty, so I believe that I should blah, blah, whatever it is, and it follows. You, you spoke a lot about money. You give more aid to Israel than every other country combined, and you killed America. Well, I wouldn't say it's legitimate. Oh, okay. No, uh, okay. Well, they've done hideous things to Palestinians, and they run over people with tanks in their houses and things like that. Some of them do. But there's still a question of what is human and people acting like human beings versus people acting like animals. And the game of the British, and they spent a lot of time, there's a group which Dennis is an expert on called the Congress for Cultural Freedom and British anthropologists of coming in and imposing cultures on people to exactly keep people from being human. One of our colleagues, the former foreign minister of Guyana, used to say, if the British want you to drop dead, they will send an anthropologist to your little village. And the anthropologist will say, oh, I've just discovered your ancient religion is based on cannibalism. You've got to go back. I mean, who would attack these indigenous people who believe in cannibalism? That's their right. So you create a cult and you impose it on these people and they fall into it if they're degraded enough. And that's, and then you might say that that's the problem. We have a whole bunch of cannibals. But who created this? 
And that is why LaRouche keeps identifying the British and the British Empire. Who drew these borders in the Middle East? How were these things decided? And, and, and then why do people go along with these things? I mean, part of the other reason that Hillary lost the election and why people are so disgusted with politics is because all of us are supposed, they, it's being imposed that we all think in these terms. They want you to speak in the mic so it's recorded. Um, speaking of, you know, you're talking about the British mandates for yes. all these territories. You're familiar with the Balfour Declaration, right? Where specifically it was Lord Rothschild saying, we're going to do this and continue this war, even though Germany won the war in 1960 and they were right, saying, we got to do this because we need a homeland for the Jewish people. Okay, but is that because Rothschild was Jewish? I don't know. That's my question. Okay, well, I'm saying that there is a higher principle, is it... which is that you have people who are committed to mm -hmm. humanity, whatever all of the lower level, whatever categories we have, and those who are committed as the British Empire and the people at the Tavistock Institute and other places to imposing on people specific labels and identities so you can never liberate yourself. For, because if you look at these cases of people who are oppressing other people, mm -hmm. the people who ultimately are the most victimized are the oppressors. They never become free. They never develop. Um, they never think, uh, I don't know, have you read the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, any of them, or of his biographies? I was very struck because he talks about this when, um, well, two things. One is in the South, the line was that the North was really uncivilized and backwards because they didn't have people to wait on them. They didn't have slaves, so therefore it was really impoverished and horrible and backwards. And so he was shocked when he got north of the Mason-Dixon line and discovered that people had things like indoor plumbing and you actually didn't need to have slaves to do all these things and that the standard of living was actually higher. But he also described the experience of his mistress who taught him how to read. She taught him how to read. Her husband found out, and this was an absolute crime to teach a slave how to read for obvious reasons. So she was you know, going to lose her marriage. So she basically not only stopped teaching him to read, but became one of the most brutal, vicious, nasty people imaginable. So Frederick Douglass went on to be fluent in many languages, to be a statesman, to be Lincoln's ambassador to Haiti and everything else. This woman ended up a shriveled, old, nasty person who destroyed herself. And, and I think it's really important to, to remember that because ultimately the question is actually the immortality of mankind and not the particular life that any one of us has while we're here. And so I would, I would choose to answer it from that standpoint. I would like to caution you on trying to uh, pigeonhole groups. Uh, you can take any group of people or any subgroup and you have a bell curve. At one end of the bell curve are some truly evil people. And the, and it, and it, but it's a small number, but then the curve grows and the average population gets larger and at the bottom at the other end, you have some brilliant people, brilliant scientists, engineers. And what you try to do is create the possibility for more people to move to that side of the curve where people want to help humanity, where you have technological brilliance and weed out the evil ones. Any subgroup, I don't care if you pick Catholics, Jews, Russians, Poles. Now it's called it's called pigeon. No, no, it's called pigeonholing. 
when you take a group and just say the label and try to impose this characteristic, and pigeonholing is the appropriate word because pigeons have bird brains. And if you, do, if you don't want to take the time and energy to look at individual human beings and what they accomplish, then you engage in that bird brain activity. So at the one end of the Jewish scale, you have people like Einstein, brilliant scientists who have improved the world. And you have some really evil people on the other side who have done dastardly things, stolen money and, and done all. But my issue is my country is fighting wars for another country. No, 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 no. Your country is fighting wars to improve humanity. Where there is evil in the world, we try to combat it. I think. Afghanistan or any of the countries that we were previously not at war with, and now there are. And the three countries that don't have international banks now are North Korea, Iran, and Cuba. So how do you, well, how do you explain this? this? Okay. It's, it's still pigeonholing. Yeah, 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 but don't worry about it. So it's, it's, it's okay. We're, we're, we're going to take a couple other questions. Let me just say something here, though, about this. The issue that happens, that comes up, that's continually confronted us, and Will Wirtz has been talking about it, uh, Mike Billington referenced it also, is the British Empire. Let, let's just get at what this is. The source of evil on the planet is the British Empire. There is no Israel source of evil without the British Empire. Israel itself was established not through Balfour, but in the 19th century through the work of Disraeli and others as part of Palmerston's operation, Lord Palmerston's zoo. Now, the same thing happened in Islam. They did the same thing in Islam. For example, the entire Muslim Brotherhood is a British process. It's a British creation, and terrorism in the world today emanates from London, not from Tehran, for example. So that's another example of the same thing. The way it worked is Palmerston had, we, we called it the Palmerston Zoo, wrote a, we did something about this many years ago now, about 25 years ago, a presentation for a conference. And we shot, tried to show how every population was targeted. By, uh, by the British imperial interests that occupied the various nations of the globe. And if you take the United States today, uh, and because of course we would have a difference with Tom on the question of the wars, there are a lot of evil wars the United States has been fighting. They're all being fought on behalf of the British Empire. The attack on Donald Trump right now is not from Hillary Clinton. The attack on Donald Trump is from the British Empire. The core people and, and poor person involved is not even Christopher Steele, although that's MI6. This is an operation being run on behalf of a, co a common combination of people who believe on exterminating the planet. Now, now, that is not to say that there are not several people in Israel who also agree with them on that. That's true. But there's also people in Wall Street that agree with them on that. And there's a lot of other people by identifying, oh, sorry, and Saudi Arabia also. But, but you see, the, the issue has been so that this is just clear. And here's why we are very sensitive about this. See, we, we put about a book a long time ago called Dope Incorporated. We went through how the British Empire ran the drug traffic and how it was that the drug traffic was a new form of opium war. What happened was the ADL then said, well, when they say British, they mean Jewish. So then what happened was that we were then identified, and LaRouche was, of course, referred to as anti-Semitic for a very long time. So we know all about who the bad guys are who, are who have Jewish surnames. Why are we telling you, are we saying to you here, and otherwise making the point, it's the British? Because the ADL itself was a creation of the British. So the very thing you're talking about as, for example, Zionism, is a British creation. The fact that they themselves believe themselves to be whatever, all that as they say, you know, the super whatever conspirators is irrelevant to the truth. That this is, this is the core mechanism of the British Empire and this is how it works. And, and, and so our notion in our discussion, right, so, so everybody just thinks about it is, if you look at what Trump is actually allowing him, allowing the United States to do, in the collaboration with Russia and China, 
that's something that comes from work that we did. It doesn't mean that he's doing it because we did it. We did the work. No, Donald Trump is an independent entity who has decided that the United States ought to be defended and that America can be made great again on its own merits. There are many ideas he has that we don't particularly agree with, but there's various, but the, the, but the presidency that he has is capable of doing what he's saying. And so I would just say that in, in our discussion, so we're going, to, we're going to move it here now to other questions. What we're concerned to do is to make sure people are clear, all right, the enemy is the British, here's the solution, we can implement it, let's move forward. And as we do that, by the way, everybody who's an enemy of that will manifest themselves. So the degree to which any of these people, and there are many who are evil, need to be identified for the evil they do, that will happen just by pursuing the battle strategy that we've been outlining. We have something? That it? You should answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have somebody coming up. I, I need to add something here. This is John Sigerson. Um, the, um, representation. I mean, I mean, I have brown eyes, and I, I think probably people with green eyes are underrepresented, and you know, in 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 various ways, and. Also, I mean, and this was this was the uh, the source of great levity uh, at an earlier time in Britain that 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 there was a huge fight about whether the people who broke their eggs on the narrow end uh, or on the larger end were represented, and there was a huge fight about that. I think you you can read Jonathan Jonathan Swift about that, but. Um, but seriously, this question of representation, I think, also just needs a little bit of uh, clarification because um, people, th uh, and this is the problem between a democracy and a republic. The United States represents a republic. It is not a democracy. When people are, 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 are elected as representatives of their, their groupings or whatever, it's, they're not representing the backward element, you know, every single backward uh, you know, tendency of their grouping. First of all, their their commitment is to is to elevate whoever they do represent those particular into the highest level. But even on a on a on a higher level, they 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 really should represent the entire nation and the entire and actually the interests of the entire world. And that's what I mean. Unfortunately, we don't see that in a, in many. Uh, in our, many of our congressmen today, except when they're ex exceptional circumstances, when they rise above that, as they have done in the past. But this idea of representation is is a is a slippery thing because because basically, you know, a a person who is elected as and given a a, a, a responsibility for a a group of people really is not just responsible for that group. They're in, responsible for the entire nation and the entire world. And that's what representation really means. And that doesn't have any color. It doesn't have any, uh, any, any particular racial or any uh, aspect of that. If you're Jewish and you're, you, uh, you are repre and you're a decent representative, you're representing everybody. You're not just representing Jews. Otherwise, you're a rotten uh, representative as far as I can uh, in my book. I'd just like to make that comment. Is that it? Anybody else? You go ahead. They just have to move up. Yeah, I can't see. There's a pillar. Sorry. Yeah, hi, Alvin here. Um, so I, I think what the earlier part of uh, the discovery, well, I missed Diane's presentation. I, I got here late, so I'm sorry about that. But uh, for uh, the uh, reintroduction to NASA that was always useful and, and welcomed uh, because it's always inspiring and uplifting. Uh, but I think that on the discussion as it began, uh, I, frankly, I thought it was very useful um, because these are the types of things that uh, we run into, the tendency to uh, play the game of the British and divide ourselves on what we've always identified as Lynn has always called single issues. Um, so I think we run into it in the streets with so-called partisanship, 
uh, a way of avoiding the realities of the paradigm shift that's underway that many people don't know about, or the fight to uh, uh, save the presidency of the United States and then uh, implement lens for laws. Uh, but people get lost. It's certainly, I think, very common in the so-called Latino community uh, and in the black community. So I think what was important were the responses of both Diane and Dennis on this, uh, starting with, as Diane started, that it's a geopolitical game. And then uh, once again, we call out the British hand and that people need to look in the mirror and get rid of the monarchy that they're facing within themselves. Uh, and that's, of course, why we sing. Uh, and these are people that then should come to our course and engage in universal principles that were written by uh, all kinds of fellows from all kinds of places and all kinds of languages that we don't know. So uh, it, it was a good lesson for me to then turn around and talk with people about this because we get this kind of stuff all the time and uh, it was dealt with at a higher level and I appreciate that, the way it was responded to. So uh, like John, I really didn't have a question, but I was glad that it all came up. <clears throat> I wanted to uh, ask both Diane and Tom. And Diane mentioned or referenced the fact that the Chinese uh, or the uh, perspective of the Silk Road is to lift everyone out of poverty. Uh, and part of the tactics they, they're using is to actually go into communities or areas, villages, and connect with the people who are very poor and determine how to do this. And you mentioned that uh, one aspect of this is to give people who have been in that condition for a long time some idea of ambition, which I thought was an unusual term to use. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about that in the context of what Tom represents around this idea of the space program as an international effort and the commitment also of the Silk Road that there be a space Silk Road that there be a collaboration in moving into an entirely different realm in outer space. Uh, it seems to me that this idea of ambition uh, or lifting people out of poverty from the standpoint of LaRouche's idea that an economy is judged by increasing the relative potential of the population involves the idea that there are billions of people who have been denied the right to make a contribution in science and in new technologies. And that the idea of the Silk Road to unleash that potential of billions of people who have been under Frederick Douglass's period told it's illegal to learn how to read, or during the opium wars saturated with drugs. And with the homeless situation, New York City, one out of every 10 children in the public school system homeless, it's cold as hell out there. Uh, you just think about this, I've been told there's some schools where between 40 and 60% of the kids in that school are homeless. What if there are Einsteins there? You know, uh, how do we unleash that? So what I wanted to ask both Diane in this question of relative population density and this perspective of having everyone out of poverty by 2050, what that means in terms of unleashing a, an explosion of a cognitive capability. And then Tom, how that would uh, tie in to this enormous potential of breakthroughs in space research. Um, and just to add one other question on that, most of us, I think, think about the success of the space program as something that happened a very long time ago, which is walking on the moon. There have been other breakthroughs. Gravitational waves have been demonstrated. There's been breakthroughs in non-manned flights to Pluto and other places. And I was wondering if you might also, or even the fact that we now know there was water on Mars. I mean, this is like huge. I wondered if you could also comment on some of the breakthroughs that have been made and, you know, that maybe we don't think about that much and what that means towards this idea of unleashing an enormous international capability in new science into space. <clears throat> I'll answer that one first because Diane can back me up because she's more intelligent than I am and would get a better perspective. But one of the things that 
we, we need, need to look at is we have people still in Africa who are sending their children into the forest, gathering up firewood so they can boil water so that they don't get river blindness when they drink it, right? These people are not learning how to combat uh, poverty. They are impoverished on their own. If we are able to bring electricity, a grid throughout Africa, they don't need to do that anymore. They can send these kids to school. These kids can then discover new uh, ways to battle cancer. The same thing can be held in South America. Uh, if you look at the African continent, it is basically gridless except along the edges. China is interested in developing Africa, not because they have charity in their mind. They don't want to develop markets for their own products. And if you have somebody living in a hut earning $2 a month, they're not going to buy any flat screens TVs. <laughs> However, if you can raise the level of education and ability, provide the work, all of a sudden you can develop the rest of the world. They're very unlike what we experience here in New York City, in America, in the Northeast, in, in the West, what we call the Western world. China has gotten its own country out of that poverty-stricken zone. I saw pictures of Shanghai uh, 30 years ago. I was in Shanghai last year. It is like night and day. Shanghai looks like Disney's Tomorrowland. Spectacular. Building all over the place, providing jobs and things for their people to do. They are making inroads into Africa to develop those markets, bring electricity, bring rail transportation. They're making the world better. We need to support that kind of effort. The New Silk Road basically is a structure that makes that effort work. And the fact that we here uh, can support it, it's sh with showing our intelligence. You need to hang around with people who can make things happen. When I was privileged to join uh, NASA, I was working with people who were making things happen. It was my dream job. I loved it. And I was I'm very, very low in that NASA totem pole, believe me. I would get coffee and things like that for people. I would bring the paper. I would run their Xerox machines. However, I learned a lot. I participated in, in things that now I look back on and say, hey, my goodness, I, I was there and I helped a little bit. Well, every one of us needs to be in that position. Hang around with intelligent people who want to make things happen. Each day, make the world a little bit better. Here's two good examples of intelligence, raw intelligence that is being directed to a purpose. You can't beat that. And that's one of the reasons why when they asked me to come here, I accepted the invitation. <laughs> well, I had, um, there were a couple points I wanted to make. One, I just wanted to get across to people that we, the reason why we may not be morally fit to survive is we place value on the wrong things. And there are many things these days that we seem to value more than the creative potential of our fellow human beings. Uh, and I think that we have to think differently about it. The other thing, I love hearing you talk about NASA because I'm in the middle of reading Gene Kranz's book, Failure is Not an Option. And the thing is incredible because when he comes in there, you know, you have this race with the Soviets to get to the moon and it's, you know, and the country's getting behind and there's this kind of, but also they're trying to do something that no one ever did before. So they're throwing people together who have to figure out how to solve problems that no one ever solved before and creating agencies and divisions of labor that didn't exist before. And then as, as the thing gets more and more advanced and more and more complex, you have literally hundreds of people who are engaged in different ways in making this mission successful. And it, it's just, and he talks about certain aspects like some of the older, older guys like in their 30s <laughs> as he was, right? In the late 20s. Well, late 20s, right. And then the new guys who are just out of college who have learned new computer, because that was the big thing going on during NASA were these breakthroughs in 
having, you know, computers as opposed to human beings doing all the math as we saw in that film recently, Hidden Figures and so on. But also the other thing that really struck me was, um, and I wish I were more, it's a little paradoxical as a, having been raised a Quaker that I got very interested in learning certain things about the Civil War and certain battles. And Will Wirtz spoke about various battles here before, but when you're fighting a war, and LaRouche has made this point many times, the question is not, the war is not necessarily won because you have more material and more manpower. It's won because you have an idea which will come as a surprise to your adversary. And when you have such an idea, usually there is an enormous amount of risk associated with it, as there was in every single one of these missions that these guys were involved in. Um, and especially after the the crew that burned up on the launch pad, I mean, this was, uh, that you had to face that your decisions and your commitment to perfection has real life and death consequences. But if you think about General MacArthur at Inchon, I mean, he, and luckily his father had been a civil war general and had warned him about the war councils. And he said, you get to these things and you propose a battle and all of your superiors are gonna say no. And he could see that it was very urgent to stop tens of thousands of American troops from being cut off and cut off from supplies and just losing of attrition that you had to make this landing in an area where you had these tides. And I used to have all the details, but I forget how many miles out the, it, the tide would go. And if you got there at low tide, you'd be in like four feet of mud. And you had basically a two hour window in which you could get the boat in, get people out of the boats at high tide so they weren't stuck in the mud, carry the thing out and, get, I mean, it was unbelievable. So he presents this, and of course, just like his father warned him, every single one that says, no, 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 I'll say, don't do it. And he personally decided in a sense to take the personal risk upon himself of forcing this thing through and saying we're doing it because I can't have it on my conscience that this number of people died when it was not necessary. And I will risk everything for that. And um, it, that's unfortunately a rare quality, but we have to cultivate that in ourselves and we have to um, take ourselves and our decisions much more seriously because the moment that we're in right now, I referenced 2016 as being a rev kind of a revolutionary moment. We're in the aftermath of it. Nothing is locked in. There is enormous potential. There is also in the British Empire, if this relationship between the US, Russia and China comes together, it is the end of their system. So they are not gonna let go. We're not gonna get a little bit of, Mueller is not gonna back down because he's in a little bit of trouble. We actually have to destroy this apparatus. You have to crush it. These people do have to go to jail. You, we cannot take anything less because of the slightest millimeter of not doing the job is something that they are going to dig in their fingernails to try and dismantle it. And I think we can win. I will say that, but I think people should not be naive and not think that um, anything is a foregone conclusion because it's not. And I wanted to use the triple curve because the blowout of the financial system is the biggest Achilles heel that this administration has. And if this is not addressed appropriately, everything goes into a cocked hat. Thank you, Diane. I really liked your presentation, so it's a question for you. It's a, a tamer one, I promise. Um, it's really about the furthering. It's really about the furthering of life. So if you look, so this is really, we're in situ here, so to speak, in New York. So I'm going to pick on New York State, for instance. So if we went back to the 1830s and we looked at a time of economic prosperity and development up in Utica, which was then slated to be capital, we saw a lot of this Greek revival architecture, and it wasn't by accident. There was a harking back to the role of government in public construction. And this is just a comment. I just think it's kind of disappointing if you could go down Broadway, for instance, and find some beautiful high Victorian-style buildings 
and then find some really plain sheetrock and drop ceiling. There's certainly a disconnect from the architecture of that time to where we're going. But also that following decade in the 1840s, we saw, and this is going to economy, a time of severe economic depression, really the nation's first industrial depression. We came out of it. What was disappointing, I guess, for me at this point of life is there's really no discourse between both political lines versus in the past there was much more of an open communication, whether you agreed or not, or really didn't disagree on things. So I guess what I, my question is, is how for us to hark back on some of that intellectual honesty with one another from that time period and to bring that into construction projects today that are going to last into the future instead of building something out of sheetrock and drop ceilings that's just not going to last. Well, that's great. Um, but that will involve the thorny debate because with all of this crazy identity politics and so on, people say, well, beauty, what's beautiful? Isn't that whatever I feel like? If I say something is beautiful and someone else says, why did you vomit on the sidewalk in front of me? <laughs> right? You know, how do you define that? And this, I think, is, um, again, to go back to this question of relative potential population density, because beauty contributes to the potential development of, of mankind. That things that are beautiful tend to make people better and also they conform to certain natural proportions, for example, and, and things like that. That's right. But I'm really glad you brought this up because I was thinking when you said the question of debate, this is one of the most evil, evil, evil things that has been done to our society, which is that human beings are not supposed to disagree with each other. No, I, this is hideous. If you think about Socrates, it doesn't mean you might not, because the ultimate objective is you want to come to a higher principle, hopefully. But if you're not allowed to have a disagreement, you can never get to that. And the means of communication are really insidiously evil. And it's not to say that it's not a usefulness. Our organization uses Facebook and Twitter and these things. But I have gotten the language of Facebook makes my skin crawl. These things that people say, uh, and, and the way they try and manipulate you to open things. Well, a woman was walking down the street and then she saw this. And you're supposed to click on the thing and find out what it is. Or you have these tear jerk stories, you know. Oh, the woman, a, a homeless man gave her his last $20 because he ran out of, she ran out of gas and then she set up a GoFundMe and raised $300,000. Oh, that's so wonderful. Oh. I mean, this is sick stuff, and it turns people into juveniles, to infants, to four-year-olds. People don't like to call each other on the telephone. No, we, we're going to send a text. We'll have a text. Why? Because if you talk on the phone, you might hear inflection. You might hear irony. There might be a difference between what someone means if they say, you know, whatever, everyone knows you can say something in such a way as to mean it's opposite, but when you send it in a text or an email, often you really can't tell. And, and this contributes greatly to the dark age that we are in. That's why I'm very concerned about the culture. It came up, um, someone was asking at the beginning, I said I didn't, ha you didn't have time to answer there, why did you want to organize a chorus? Because we, it, I wonder if the American people are going to be elevated enough to win this war. I think we can. I think you see the effect of people when they're inspired. I think the people in West Virginia, where China's investing $83 billion and the governor said there's going to be 100,000 new jobs, I think that the idea that they may now have, that they have a future, is going to be very liberating to their thought processes. And perhaps they, you know, this is something that's very contagious. There's nothing like optimism to free people up and, you know, let them become creative. But I really worry because you look at what people think they want. 
you look at what people have an emotional connection to the degree of infantilism and and the isolation which also makes people very very depressed because they the empathy people don't have empathy they don't think about what it would be like to be in someone else's shoes or you know i've told this story uh before but i often think about it the wonderful wonderful vocal coach and um a uh, musician, Sylvia Olden Lee, who worked, some of us had the privilege of working with her for many years. And um, she was the first, for people who don't know, she was the first African American vocal coach hired by the Met. She fought incessantly till they finally got Marian Anderson there. But more than that, she was a very Socratic, very devastatingly truthful person. And she would never be mean about it, but she would say things like, why, and it was a Southern accent, why are you doing that? <laughs> and she said, now, I don't know. I mean, maybe you have a reason for doing that, but I would not do that that way, <laughs> you know, and it's just very, so one morning um, I came downstairs, she would stay at our house frequently and, um, me in the mornings, for those of you who know me, and maybe you can tell now, I am not a really laid back, relaxed person. I am kind of a driven, neurotic, anxiety ridden, have 7,000 things going on every minute. And so when I wake up in the morning, I am planning my day. And I plan my day every minute. I don't have a minute that does not have something in it. So the morning is a very, important quiet time for me and if you try to talk to me in the morning then um it's not always the most friendly conversation <laughs> so i came downstairs and she was sitting there at our breakfast table and she says good morning and i like mm. and she says child when you wake up in the morning don't you just thank god that you're alive <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, that really had not occurred to me. <laughs> but at any rate, I think um, this, we, there's a certain quality of her, and you see it in older people a lot, which we have lost, but we will get back when you, when the optimism and, you know, I think we'll win. You look at China, you think about where they were under Mao, you think about violin teachers being stuck in the basement with sewage dripping on their heads. And I mean, really hideous things that happened in that time. And China, look at where they are now. So obviously we ought to be able to succeed, but we will not succeed if we don't take a harsh look at some of these problems. Okay, Good afternoon, Mr. Rush. My name is Mohammed Kamal. My question is, in my lifetime, I never seen this community have any bad people. I 10 years in America, but I never seen any bad people in Jewish community, but other community have. The how can uh, the Jewish people produce better people or other community people cannot do? No, he, he was not Jewish. Jewish, Jewish, Jewish people. What is Jewish people, man? Jewish, He's like Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> he was clear. <laughs> I so so some people people. Don't, don't think they I understood what you said. Just go ahead yeah. and say it again. The other community did not produce the better people, better education, better scientists, but youth people come to higher, higher level, high level, high, high level educated people. Okay, there's something. Okay, so this is sort of a, this is a New York question. This is a New York question. He's basically saying that he has been, what is it, we said in 10 years, is that yeah, what it yeah, was, yeah, right? Most, yeah. and he's been in the country, or he's been, he's been observing that when you're talking about Jewish people, they seem to have a high standard of living, high level of education, and he's never seen them like, you know, 
borrowing money or things like that. Is that what you said, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, so he says, oh, so why, why is that, okay? And I said, okay, this is a New York question, okay? Because as some people know, as my, and, and, and my wife is, uh, and her mother, oh, my mother, uh, you had to hear Lynn's mother on the phone, I mean, okay? Uh, my, my mother-in-law worked at Macy's for 37 years. She's like honorary Yiddish, okay? Uh, let's just put it like this. In New York City, in the period of the 19th century and the early 20th century, a series of successive groups came to the city. The Irish, the Italians, the Jews, um, <laughs> Russians also, uh, although that, uh, others. And in different, well, that was a little bit later. They, they, when you got the Puerto Ricans, and so it was 1950s. Uh, African Americans began coming here in large numbers, large numbers, uh, in the period actually right after the Civil War, uh, but after the First World War, in particular, up in the Harlem area and some of the other areas. And New York City, until 1966, was the most industrialized city in the United States. People don't realize that there were one million industrial workers in New York City in 1966, way more than Detroit. See? That's why New York was powerful. That's why people, why, why, and of course, Alexander Hamilton and also Washington had created New York City and some of the areas around Patterson, New Jersey, and some of the others for that purpose. So people came here. And these groups, when they came, depending on where, when they came and, and, and how they, 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 they got here, uh, were forced into a situation in which they had to find ways to, on the one hand, preserve a certain solidarity among the group, but also assimilate into the society at large. I mentioned this term before, the cosmopolitan Jew. And I mentioned that term because that was a term that Hitler used. It was the idea that it was really bad that Jews somehow, no matter where they went, they were always getting kicked out of everywhere, more or less, because they were often used, especially in the period of the Catholic Church's dominance of Europe, uh, for usury, because it was against the law of the Catholic Church for you to do usury, so they had the Jews do it. And that's how you got, for example, the Venetian ghetto. Uh, that, that, that Shakespeare writes about in The Merchant of Venice. So Jews were often getting kicked out of all kinds of places. What they would do is they would assimilate the cultures of the places they would go. But at the same time, there was a religious persuasion as well that they tended to preserve. In New York, one of the most important people to know about is a man by the name of Sholem Aleichem. He was a Jewish writer. Uh, he was from uh, Russia and uh, represented something called the Yiddish Renaissance. And the reason he was important was because he wrote these books about a character or using a character named Tevya. Tevya was a dairyman, hmm? milkman. And Tevya was one of these guys who always thought, well, not that he was always thought he knew better or something like that, but he was always misquoting various of the Hebraic texts to make sense for the situation he found himself in. And, and Shalom Aleichem used this character to satirize and to criticize, but in a happy way, his compatriots. And it uplifted them because it made them laugh at themselves. This is crucial because when you talk about Jews and Jewish humor, this always has a tragic element. But the tragedy is, uh, is, 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 is always put within a context. We have to fight against what's wrong in us. And if we fight against what's wrong with, with us, we'll always do better. And that's how we have to think. Now, that tradition was a very powerful one, and it was very important in the United States. It was very important, for example, to African Americans in the Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s. But in 1967, with the Six Day War, that changed. But 1967 was a year 
in which many things were changed in the country um, in the aftermath of the Kennedy assassination. I don't want to go into it now, but Zionism as, a, as an ideology gained a different meaning. And what was done was a combination of things coming out of the Amer American establishment. Mac George Bundy was very important in this. They drove Jews out of the civil rights movement. This was done through the Black Power movement. Um, it was done by the FBI, but it was done by George Bundy, who had come up with a little scheme, which was if you could divide the African American from the Jew, the civil rights movement would collapse. And King had that exact experience in 1967 from April 4th, when he came out against the war in Vietnam. And what happened was that by June, well, of course, he was dead by April of the next year, but by June of 67, Okay, this is he was still alive when the six day war happened almost all of the jews who were left in the civil rights movement walked out in mass from it toward zionism the jewish defense league was then created the following year you had these black power black nationalist anti-semitic uh organizations and down in brooklyn that were created and with the, once you had the King assassination and the Kennedy assassination, bam, it all broke apart. So since that time, there's been another feature in American life that's been introduced. And the ADL and the other organizations became dominant, whereas earlier you had had not only a progressive but an essential element for all of American culture, which was being provided by Jewish people, literature, and that orientation. Um, one of the things that we do, and the LaRouche movement, famously, for people who know this, was 20 to 25 percent Jewish. Certainly, when I joined it, it was at least that. Okay, and it was it was always it was always fun. I remember the first time I came to a meeting, and just to say, I, I, it was a first conference I came to it was 1970, and it was the the evening of the conference, and it had been a kind of a confusing but very exciting day. I was in an apartment someplace on the west side. It was December 28th, 29th. Uh, it was cold, very cold, but the whole apartment was, it was, had to be 80 degrees in there, 85 degrees in there. And there were all these people talking more than I could talk, faster than I could talk. And I would say, this is great. What, what, what is this organization? And a uh, man who's ne dead by now, now named Steve Pepper said to me, uh, you just never been in a room with a bunch of Jews before. <laughs> And I, I said, really, is that what this is? Well, well I, I felt right at home, I'll put it like that, okay? So anyway, just to say, long answer to a short question, but an important one about New York City. Almost everybody in New York City, one way or the other, is actually Jewish. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Diane advises that on that note, we ought to end. So we're, 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 going to, we're going to conclude the meeting for this week. And we say Happy New Year to everybody here and all of the people who sometimes watch these shows.